questions. Christian Zohar, Lonohab Deputy, Regina Capel. After eight years, the Prime Minister is not worth the cost or the crime. The previous Conservative government reduced car thefts with common sense policies like tougher penalties for repeat offenders. The Prime Minister changed that and gave car thieves easy bail and house arrests. Under Conservatives, car thefts down by 50%. Under Liberals, car thefts up by 34%. And now he's being told at his fancy summit that his policies are the problem. Celeste Power of the Insurance Bureau said car thefts are up because, quote, Profits are high and penalties are light. So when will the Prime Minister abandon their soft on crime approach so car thefts can come down? Hey, hey. Donald Ball, Parliamentary Secretary for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, on the contrary, would the Conservatives actually like to know that since 2006, the five years with the highest amount of car thefts in Canadian history were us under the Stephen Harper government? We are actually reducing crime. Today, we had the auto summit where we brought in leaders across the country, including police. Mr. Speaker, we are working on tangible solutions, not just slogans from the Conservatives. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. Those were the first five years we inherited from a previous soft on crime Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. But it's not just crime that this government's policy is making worse. On April 1st, the Prime Minister is going to drive up grocery prices again with another hike to his carbon tax. And the impact on this affects Canadians every step of the way from farm to fork. Keith Warriner, professor at the University of Guelph, said 44% of growers are operating at a loss presently and three quarters have difficulty offsetting production cost increases. Instead of driving grocery prices up even higher, why doesn't he cancel his plan to hike the carbon tax? Hey, hey. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, we will take no lessons from the Conservative who have no plan, Mr. Speaker. I guess their plan is to ask Jenny, Mr. Speaker. But on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to make grocery to stabilize price in this country, Mr. Speaker. It's called competition, Mr. Speaker. Canadians at home understand that. They are the only ones who are blocking the further reform we want to put, Mr. Speaker, because Canadians understand that we want stabilized price, we want more choice, we want more competition. On this side, we'll fight for Canadians at every step of the way. The Honourable Member from Regina Capel. You would think that they would have thrown those talking points out after this week when we <laughs> learned, Mr. Speaker, all the relationships between Liberal staff and Loblaws, like Brian Topp and Don Guy, both who collect checks from Loblaws, and last year they met twice with the PM's Director of Policy. Oh. Or, like Taya Backett, the in-house lobbyist at Loblaws. She used to have an office in the PMO. You could run a superstore with all the staff <laughs> over there that have relationships with Loblaws. When will the Prime Minister realize it's not Conservative volunteers driving up grocery prices, it's the carbon tax, stupid! expression known to, to many, uh, I do uh, warn all MPs uh, to please to try to uh, watch uh, and to stay safely on the right side of parliamentary debate. Uh, the Honourable um, Minister of, in of Innovation. Speaker, I will abide by your words, Mr. Speaker. And one thing that we're doing when he talks about Superstar is right, and, and it's, I'm happy to talk about that because that's actually what we're trying to bring, Mr. Speaker. We're trying to bring more competition. I've been in touch with foreign grocers to bring more competition, to bring more options for Canadians. And people are watching at home. They understand and on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. We have a plan. We are working for Canadians. On this side, they have no plan. And the only plan we've seen is to ask Jenny, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work for Canadian at every step of the way. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After eight years of this Liberal government, the housing crisis is hitting Canadians hard. For example, in Quebec, the average rent has gone up by 19 percent over one year, and it will take twice as long to pay off a mortgage and up to 25 years to save up a down payment. 
That's what Canadians are facing after eight years of this Liberal government. Yet this government is very good at photo ops. When will they instead work that hard on building housing? The Honourable Minister of Immigra Innovation. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. If there's something the Conservatives are good at, it's insulting mayors. The last time we heard from the Conservative leader, he was insulting the mayor of Quebec City, the mayor of Montreal, who is working with us to build more housing. What we're doing on this side of the House is creating programs to build affordable housing, collaborating with provinces and municipalities. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know that we must work together, and that's exactly what we're doing. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, for eight years, this government has been insulting all Canadians with their terrible housing record. Even the president of the CMHC has admitted that the government has no plan to fix the situation. There has been a 28 percent decrease in housing starts over the last year. That's the liberal reality. So my question, when will you stop holding press releases with photo ops and when will you start building homes? That's what Canadians want. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I have a great deal of respect for my colleague for Louis Saint Laurent. That said, I don't think we have much to learn about videos and photo ops from the Conservatives. Recently, we saw the Conservative leader doing a photo op and a video at the Port of Montreal, thinking that a video would fix auto theft. We have met with leaders in order to fix this problem and others. We talked about monitoring. We talked about innovation. We talked about technology. What the Conservatives don't understand is that in order to move this country forward, we must work together. The Honourable Member for salaberry sur roi Mr. Speaker, Quebec has been a pioneer within Canada in showing compassion to people who are suffering. It was the first jurisdiction to, to offer medical assistance in dying. And then today again, it is ahead. Quebec is ready to authorize advanced requests for, peop for people with a serious and incurable neurocognitive disease. The Quebec legislation has been in place for eight months. People who are suffering have waited long enough. Will the government modify the criminal code so that Quebec can move forward with these advanced requests? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was lucky enough to be Minister of Health previously, and as my colleague did, I would like to recognize the important contribution of the Quebec government and Quebecers over the last several years in order to move forward. Thinking and action on this incredibly sensitive and important issue, we must all work together and we will determine the way forward with the government of Quebec over the months to come. The Honourable Member. Well, Canada can continue to reflect, but Quebec is ready. The National Assembly of Quebec unanimously asked the federal government to modify the criminal code so that Quebec can go ahead with its advance requests legislation. Ottawa has a moral duty to grant Quebec's unanimous request. Canadians can reflect longer if that's what they wish to do, but that shouldn't cause years of useless suffering for Quebecers. Will the government finally legislate to enable Quebec to authorize advance requests? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I'd like to thank my colleague for discussing this sensitive issue. We know that people's choice and control over their lives, their choice f to have medical assistance in dying is already part of the choices people have. We also need to protect those who are most vulnerable. We will work closely with healthcare providers. We will elaborate codes of conduct, and we will look closely at matters both having to do with the criminal code and with healthcare delivery. The Honourable Member for Rosemont la petite Mr. Speaker, People are struggling at the grocery store. For months, food banks have been overwhelmed. Montreal Liberal MPs know this. It's happening to them, too. But we in the NDP are offering solutions, like our bill to lower the costs of a grocery basket. But the Liberals voted against lowering prices for Quebecers. 
these liberals really want to support their buddies like Galen Weston. Is this all they're really going to do? The Honorable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question, but I don't really understand where he's going with it. He ought to be very proud because in the competition reform that we presented in three parts, Mr. Speaker, we accepted many of the recommendations of the leader of the NDP. So they should be happy that by working together hand in hand, we are increasing competition in this country. All the experts will tell you more choices and competition will stabilize prices. My colleagues should get up in this House and thank us for working together for consumers. Honorable member from London, Fanshawe. The fact of the matter is that the Liberals voted no on the NDP bill to lower food prices for Canadians. Yeah. They voted okay. against giving the Competition Bureau more powers to crack down on greedy grocery chains and take, that take advantage of families. Hey. Sky-high food prices are forcing Canadians with full-time jobs to resort to food banks to feed their families. Under these out-of-touch Liberals, ultra-rich CEOs win and Canadians lose. Why are the Liberals determined to keep grocery prices high for Canadians? Yes. The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, again, uh, I'm happy to hear the question from my colleagues. She, she should be happy because we actually listen to what the NDP ought to propose, and a lot of what has been proposed by the leader of the NDP has already been included in our bill to reform competition in this country, Mr. Speaker. One thing that we should do is to work together, Mr. Speaker. Her bill, the bill that's been presented yesterday, will go to committee, will listen to experts, will listen to recommendations, but one thing Canadians should know is that we have their back. We're going to fight for them to bring stability and grocery price in this country. The Honourable Member from Lethbridge. After eight years of this government's reckless policies, our country is in a place of crime and chaos. Since 2015, sexual assault cases have increased by 72 per cent. 72 per cent. That's a big number here, folks. The Liberal government's soft on crime approach is a direct attack on women and girls in this country. It's disgusting. And so how many more sexual assaults need to take place for this government to finally do something. Good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice thank and Attorney General of Canada. I want to thank the member opposite for her question. This is a serious issue that requires a serious response and is not something that should be highlighted in a negative way in the House of Commons. This government has taken steps through Bill S-12, Bill C-3, Bill C-51. We've taken serious measures to address sexual assault crimes, including uh, sec sexual assault offenders be including on the, on the offence registry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Lethbridge. The Honourable Member is right. This isn't something to be made light of, but that is exactly what this Liberal government's policies have done. Unfortunately, after eight years of this government, the number of sexual assault cases in this country has skyrocketed by 72 per cent. 72. That's a very large number. That is many women and girls who are affected. And what makes this even worse is that so many of these crimes are committed by individuals who are out on bail who shouldn't be. And the reason they are is because of this government's soft on crime policies. The Liberals are putting women in danger. It is this government's decision to do that. So when will this Prime Minister take it seriously and do something? To your Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the issues around sexual violence and violence in general towards women is something we take incredibly seriously, including the fact that we supported legislation, nonpartisan legislation, to have proper training for judges, something unfortunately conservative senators blocked, but we persevered to ensure that women go through the criminal justice process respecting the violence that has happened and the underreporting that happens in this country, we are going to continue to do everything possible to make sure women are safe in this country. The Honourable Member from Peterborough, Kawartha. After eight years of this Liberal NDP government, chaos and crime is at epidemic levels. Just weeks ago, a mom of three was murdered in Calgary in front of an elementary school in a targeted domestic killing. Her offender had previous charges, multiple active warrants, and a no-contact order. She did everything that was asked of her, and she was still murdered in broad daylight. Why? 
because this Liberal government's soft on crime policies. Enough. We don't need summits. We need action and we need a timeline. So when will they reverse these deadly policies? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to Pub Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, it is not a partisan issue in dealing with violence against women in this country. Crimes like that are absolutely horrific. It's something that we are working hard on with not just the Minister of Public Safety, but across government to ensure that women across this country are not only safe, but are safe to report violence. As we know, oftentimes violence starts early uh, with domestic violence and can escalate one of the reasons we're also banning guns. Yeah. The Honourable Member from Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, this became a partisan issue the minute this fake feminist Prime Minister let women die. That is the reality. Ninety-four municipalities in Ontario alone have declared domestic violence an epidemic. Violent crime is up almost 40 per cent. Sexual assaults, 72 per cent. Sex crimes against children, up 126 per cent. You can bet this is partisan. It is their policies destroying the lives of Canadians and Conservatives. will stop the crime and make sure women are not murdered in front of elementary school and the guy who did it is behind bars. Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad to see the Conservatives fired up about taking the violence against women seriously. That is precisely why we have put in firearm legislation to deal with situations of intimate partner and gender-based violence. Mr. Speaker, we are putting a national freeze on the sale of and purchase and transfers of handguns. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to violence against women, we are going to put in place every measure, measure possible to keep women safe. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to this, and I'm glad to see the Conservatives passionate about protecting women. Colleagues, order colleagues. I know this is a very important and sensitive issue, which is deserving, which is deserving of all of our attention to listen to the question and all of our attention to listen to the answer. The Honourable Member for Belle Chasse Les Echemins Levy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After eight years of this government, violence in this country has increased horrifyingly. Violent crime is up by 40 percent, sexual assault by 71 percent. There are more and more femicides as well as domestic violence. Women always have to be hyper vigilant. And despite that, the Prime Minister is still letting criminals relax in their homes. A Conservative government would bring back common sense law and order policies and protect women. Meanwhile, what will the Prime Minister do to protect Canadian women? Then I have minister the Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I'm very glad the Conservatives are paying attention to the question of violence against women. Our government has taken important measures to strengthen legislation to prevent firearms use violence in this country, to prevent violence against women in the home, and in restricting firearms violence, while well, the Conservatives are actually against those policies. They should make more of an effort to bring forward policy to protect women throughout the country. The Honourable Member for Belle Chasse, Les Echemins Lévy. Mr. Speaker, women tell us about the fear, pain, torment they experienced at the hands of a violent partner or a trafficker. Conservative bills, for example, Senator Boisvenu's bill, were tabled to protect women, but what has this government been doing for eight years? It takes the side of criminals instead of victims. The good news is that our Conservative government will put an end to that. Why is this government continuing to keep violent criminals comfortably in their homes instead of them putting them behind bars where they can't hurt anyone? The Honourable Minister of Global Affairs. Mr. Speaker, 
For eight years, this feminist government has been working on protecting women, especially vulnerable women. And that's why, throughout our time in power, we've made that a priority before, during, and after COVID. For three elections, the Liberal government has won on restricting firearms violence. And three times in all of these elections, the Conservatives have voted against. I'm happy to see that my female colleagues on the other side of the House care about this. We will continue to show leadership on this file. Colleagues, colleagues, this is a very serious issue which is being raised by uh, by members. It's deserving, of course, of your respect to listen to the questions and also to listen to the answers. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, another dark day for our media and for democracy. Bell has just announced that it will be cutting 4,800 positions and that it's selling 45 radio stations, including seven in Quebec. The federal government is watching our information media die before its eyes and is not spending any money on saving our broadcasters. There has been no emergency fund, as the Bloc Québécois asked for in the fall, no tax credit for electronic media, like what there is for print media. How many more workers will be sacrificed before the minister realizes that C-18 alone will not save our Quebec media? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a dark day for 4,800 people in Canada who learned this morning in the news that they were facing layoffs. It's very upsetting for them and their families. I offer them my full support and solidarity. My colleague knows very well that $40 million has been offered to Bell Media every year. Bell Canada has been raking in billions of dollars in profits this year. They should continue to keep their commitments to provide news to the entire population. We will not be giving more public money to a billionaire company like that. The Honourable Member. I'm not talking about giving money to a billionaire company. I'm talking about helping an industry that is suffering and has been in crisis for years. As we speak, the only new money to help our media with C-18 is from Google. It's like a fox pretending that it's tending to the hens. And yet we have offered many proposals, an emergency fund, a payroll tax credit for electronic media, tax credits for advertisers and traditional media, or increasing the share of government advertising in traditional media instead of giving $50,000 to Meta, as the Liberal Party has done over the last three months. When will this government finally take action? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I share my colleagues' indignation about the decisions that companies like Bell Media have taken in order to protect the dividends of shareholders who are still raking in the profits and who are instead sacrificing 4,800 people. As my colleague knows, for more than three years, we have been fighting to modernize the Broadcasting Act, and yet the Conservatives have constantly opposed that. The regulatory framework would have been adopted three years ago if they hadn't constantly opposed it with their absolutely nonsensical gobbledygook, where they call it censorship. That's where we would be, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lac saint jean Mr. Speaker, in November, CBC revealed that Mexican crimin criminals are taking advantage of the lack of visas to come to Canada for their criminal operations. Yesterday at committee, the Minister of Immigration, the RCMP and Border Services all denied any link between the lack of need for a visa and crime. They are burying their head in the sand, although they all have access to internal reports that lay it out black on white. All three of them have proof that the cartels are taking advantage of this policy to import drugs, engage in human smuggling and more. Why doesn't the minister bring back the visas, since they know that criminals are taking full advantage of the situation? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Well, Mr. Speaker, you don't need to be an expert to understand that criminals will exploit any vulnerability they find. The member across the way should know that any announcement made in advance would create more vulnerability to be exploited. If he thinks that I'm going to make such an announcement in public, he should think again, because there are many people paying attention to what the immigration minister says and who will be in a hurry to take advantage of any change, loophole or vulnerability. I hope he will respect that in this context. The Honourable Member from Battle River Crowfoot. 
Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal NDP government, we know that the Prime Minister is not worth the cost of groceries. Don, an, in, an independent, multi-generational greenhouse operator, was forced to sell because of the cost of the carbon tax coupled with rising interest rates. After telling the Minister of Agriculture her story directly and asking him to pass Bill C-234 unamended to reduce costs for farmers, he ignored her. What does that minister have to say to Dawn and the many facing challenges like her who are losing their businesses, their livelihoods and their family legacies because of that Liberal government's policies? Yeah. The, Honourable, the Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I find it quite ironic to be lectured by the Conservative Party on our support to farmers when just at the end of last year they voted against the On-Farm Climate Action Fund to support sustainable agriculture. They voted against the Dairy Innovation and Investment Fund. They voted against support for dairy, poultry and egg supply management producers. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we will support our farmers in the transition towards a low-carbon economy and we will help Canadians make that transition. I would like to remind the member from Battle River Crowfoot that he had an opportunity to ask a question which I would encourage all members to listen carefully. I would also encourage him and all other members to listen to the answer carefully. The Honourable Member from Chatham, Kent Leamington. Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax on food is working against Canadians by decreasing both the amount and the type of food that they buy. Visits to the few banks are at record highs, over 2 million visits. And just think the new records that we're going to set once the carbon tax is quadrupled. Highline Mushrooms is in Leamington. They supply American and Canadian retailers with their mushrooms. Their American competitors don't have to pay the carbon tax, so they're forced to pay, pass along the carbon tax cost to the Canadian consumer. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will he axe the tax? Great job, Dave. Great job. The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, I would agree with the Conservative member for Regina Louvain, who recognized that there's absolutely no data to support any link between price on pollution and higher grocery price. In fact, Mr. Speaker, there is no pricing on pollution in the United States of America, and their grocery prices are the same as we have here in Canada. There is simply no link between pricing on pollution and higher grocery prices. The Honourable Member from Flamborough-Glanbrook. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Beverly Greenhouses is an award-winning greenhouse operation in Flamborough that produces healthy, fresh cucumbers for Canadians. Almost $4,000 of their $13,000 natural gas bill in October was carbon tax, wow. and it has only increased since then. When this NDP Liberal government quadruples the carbon tax, Beverly Greenhouses is going to struggle to compete with cucumbers imported from Mexico. After eight years, this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. When will this government finally axe the tax so that this family farm can continue to feed Canadians? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture and Agri-Food. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And being a farmer, I'm well aware how important it is to take care of the environment. And that's why it's so important to have a tax on pollution. And in fact, last Tuesday, in committee, Tyler McCann at the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute indicated to the committee members that there is no data to support the carbon pricing is resulting in any increase in groceries. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. There Speaker. You Order. The Honourable Member from Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, the CBC reported that the Liberals made the decision to suspend life saving funding to UNRWA without seeing any evidence of allegations or waiting for the results of the independent investigation. UNRWA is the only organization that can reach Palestinians in Gaza who are starving and who are being killed in the tens of thousands. And this government cut life-saving support. This decision needs to be reversed and somebody needs to be held accountable. Was it the minister or the PMO who decided that Canada should turn its back on starving Palestinians? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me be very clear. 
The funding that Canada is given to civilians in Gaza has increased just last week $40 million more on top of the $60 million which was already there. This makes Canada a top donor for aid helping the crisis in Gaza. We are proud Canadians want us to help. Every time there's a time of emergency, we stand up, we are clear, and we will always be there. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member from Victoria. Mr. Speaker, every day the Liberals show how out of touch they are. This week alone, they voted against an NDP bill that would lower food costs for Canadians. And then, with only two weeks notice, they scrapped the Greener Homes program that helps Canadians lower their heating bills, while they still give out billions to big oil and gas CEOs. Canadians want to do their part to fight the climate crisis, and heat pumps lower costs and save lives. We need a program that makes sure that every Canadian who wants one can get a heat pump. Will the Liberals do it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, one of the most amazing things to have seen is how popular the Greener Homes Grant and the Greener Homes Loan has been among Canadians who are taking those steps to switch the way they heat their homes and to reduce their bills at the same time. We are working on the next steps for the Greener Homes program, which is actually going to make sure that the people who need the help the most have access to the program. We would ask you to keep watching for the pro progress of this new program. Good job. Good job. Member from Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The UN General Assembly proclaimed 2015 to 2024 the International Decade for People of African Descent. This proclamation recognized the over, two, over 220 million people of African descent here in the Americas and in Canada. Mr. Speaker, this government has fully embraced the UN's proclamation by investing and developing new programs to help support black communities in Canada. Can the Minister of Diversity and Inclusion please update this House on the decade as it mo moves closer to an end? Thank you. The Honourable Minister for Diversity and Inclusion. Mr. Speaker, last night we gathered with thousands of black trailblazers from across the country to celebrate Black History Month. It was a perfect opportunity for the Prime Minister to announce that Canada will be extending the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent until 2028. Mr. Speaker, this extension builds on the $860 million that our government has committed to deliver black-made, black-led solutions. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we've always been deliberate about choices. Choice to invest in black communities, choice to call out and combat systemic racism, and a choice to celebrate Black History Month. And we're going to continue to make sure we support our communities all across the country. The Honourable Member from Dufferin Caledon. Housing hell. After eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians are literally living in housing hell. Rent has doubled. Mortgage payments have doubled. Yep. The cost to buy a house has almost doubled. And it takes 25 years now to save for a mortgage. It's no wonder for a down payment. It's no wonder there's tent cities all across this country. When will these Liberals realize you can't live in an announcement, you can't live in a photo op, you can't live in a press release, and support our common sense conservative plan to get houses built? Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing and Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate he contradicts himself every time he speaks. Just a few days ago, he was praising this federal government's record on housing. Today, he critiques it. Let me offer something else, Mr. Speaker, in terms of a contradiction. He talks about the challenges of homelessness, which admittedly are unacceptable in this country, affordability and housing, which is unacceptable in this country. He's voted against every measure the government's put forward to address that. The national housing strategy is there. It's yielding results. It will do more. We are working with municipalities to incent changes at the local level in terms of zoning. It will do more. He's voted against it, and so have all of they. They don't really care. The Honourable Member from Dufferin Caledon. You know your housing plan is an utter disaster when the only support you can find for it is to misquote a member of the opposition. That's how bad it actually is. Here's the facts. Housing 
housing investments in December are down another 18 percent. All these fake liberal announcements and photo ops, and guess what? Less houses are getting built. This liberal prime minister isn't worth the cost because their announcements mean nothing. Will they finally realize they've caused housing hell in this country and support our common sense conservative plan to get houses built? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing and Infrastructure. More slogans from the member opposite and the party opposite, Mr. Speaker. What do we see on our side? We are putting serious measures forward to work with municipalities. Across the country, over 500 have applied through the Housing Accelerator Fund. We've completed deals with 30 municipalities, working with mayors, not denigrating them. And what do we hear on the other side? What do we hear? We hear no plan at all. They want to tax home building, for example. That will not lead to more homes built. What's another big idea? They want a snitch line for residents to rat on their neighbours if there's concerns around NIMBY. That's not how you get change, Mr. Speaker. Not at all. The Honourable Member from Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, the cost of rent and mortgage payments have doubled. And this is at a time when housing starts are down in 2023. Even if the Liberals' plan came to fruition, the CIBC reported that this Liberal plan falls 1.5 million homes short of restoring affordability. People are in a cost of living crisis, and yet the Liberal Housing, Liberal housing Minister jumps from one photo op to another. No government has ever spent so much to achieve so little. When will this government build homes, not bureaucracy? Board. We are taking a comprehensive approach to building more housing. That means increasing supply. We are eliminating the GST on purpose-built rentals. We have struck deals with over 30 municipalities from coast to coast to ensure that we are getting more supply in the system, and we will make sure that we are there for vulnerable Canadians and the middle class all the while. The Conservatives on the other side of the House vote against measures to support Canadians. That's not our approach, and we will always be there for Canada. Bravo, bravo. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this government, house prices have doubled, rents have doubled, and this government is not worth the cost. A shelter for the homeless, the Bercai in Saint-Georges in Bose, reports that it is overwhelmed with requests for rooms in 2024. The government continues to abandon Canadians when it comes to housing. They need to get out of the way and let muni municipalities prosper, as Victoriaville, Saguenay, and trois Rivières are doing. Why doesn't the Prime Minister build more housing instead of building bureaucracy? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to hear a question from a colleague from the Greater Quebec City area. During its 10 years in power, the Conservative government built 24,000 housing units. We've built 10 times more, 500,000 more were announced recently. My Conservative colleagues from the region of Quebec City, would they agree to go see Quebec City with me, the mayors and municipal councillors, so we can tell them why their Conservative leader is calling all the people of Quebec incompetent? The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, French is hanging on by a thread in Canada. We saw it again in committee. A Liberal Parliamentary Secretary, the Conservatives and the NDP all voted against bilingualism for miscarriage of justice review commissioners. The Liberal complaint claimed he was defending unilingual Francophones. Francophones always lose when bilingualism takes a back seat. He added that he was also defending Anglophones. Well, yes, that we believe. Mr. Speaker, if justice is bilingual, if Canada is bilingual, will the minister commit to appointing bilingual commissioners? The Honourable Minister of Employment, I am a proud Frank Walburton. We have standards here regarding promoting bilingualism, and that applies to tribunals and throughout our system. We know and we've committed to protecting French in Quebec throughout the country, and not with one, two, three, but $4.1 billion. We are here for bilingualism and Canadian French. The Honourable Member for Rivières du Nord. Mr. Speaker, if that's true, he'll have to talk to his parliamentary secretary about it. 
French is hanging on by a thread in Canada, as I said, even in the Prime Minister's office. Radio Canada received a copy of a letter from the Privy Council stating that translating the documents produced for the Rouleau Commission would take too long and be too expensive. Even providing a simple table, table of contents would take too long and be too expensive. You'd swear they don't feel like it. You'd swear that the rights of Francophones only matter when it is easy and costs nothing. Will the Prime Minister remind his own department that respect for French as an official language is mandatory? The Honourable Member Minister of Employment. I respect my honourable colleague. We promote bilingualism. We respect the tribunal. We respect the committee. A 2,000-page bilingual report for all Canadians will be coming. The honourable member from Fundy Royal. The justice minister has spent the last week arguing with conservatives and telling Canadians that strengthening penalties for auto theft won't work. Now we all know this prime minister has a habit of throwing his justice ministers under the bus. And earlier today, the prime minister finally admitted that stronger penalties are required to tackle the auto theft crisis that he created. They can't both be right. Will the minister finally admit that he was wrong and conservatives were right, and will he commit to a repealing liberal, soft on crime policies like house arrest for car thieves? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we all know, auto theft is a very serious problem in Ontario, Quebec, and across the country. It requires consultation with experts to find a proper solution, not slogans and simple criticism of problems that don't really address the problem. So today, we had the auto summit. We brought in people from all the provinces, the police associations, different levels of governments, and they are going to come up with constructive solutions that are going to address the issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Fundy Royal. Auto Summit is not what Canadians are calling for. They're calling for action. Auto theft in Toronto is up 300 per cent. In New Brunswick, 120 per cent. This is the Liberals' own number since they took office. Only Conservatives will do what's necessary to stop the crime with a proven approach of jail, not bail for repeat offenders, ending house arrest for auto theft, and bringing in mandatory penalties for repeat offenders. Mr. Speaker, the numbers are in. The facts don't lie. Why won't this minister stand up and admit that the Liberal soft on crime agenda is a failure and it needs to change? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will agree with them insofar as the facts don't lie. Some people just have a problem interpreting them. Because the, the reality is we have, we, have tough, we have toughened the sentencing requirements for auto theft. We have, improved, we have improved and strengthened the bail system. We have improved the system in a way that is going to protect Canadians and keep them safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Niagara Falls. Speaker, this government loves photo ops and convening meetings, but they are light on action when it comes to auto theft. This government's own news release shows auto thefts in Toronto have increased 300 per cent under their watch. At home, Niagara Regional Police indicated they were investigating some 30 auto thefts just from January. The Prime Minister is responsible for the ports, the CBSA, the RCMP and the Criminal Code. It's time to stop the crime. Will this PM reverse his soft on crime catch and release policies that have helped cause this auto theft crisis? <laughs> The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary the Minister of Justice and Attorney General Thank for you, Canada. Mr. Speaker, as I've said already, this is a problem that requires consultation with all of the parties involved. Industry, different levels of government, the law enforcement community, slogans are not going to find a solution. Jenny Byrne has obviously been hired by the bumper sticker industry, and that's her pool over there for drafting them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> The Honourable Member from King's Hands. Speaker, this weekend my province of Nova Scotia was hit with one of the worst snowstorms in two decades. The Cape Breton Regional Municipality declared a local state of emergency and some communities in northern Nova Scotia like Pictou and Anaganish remain isolated. Community members are deeply concerned about their safety and that of their neighbours. And I ask this question on behalf of my honourable colleagues from Central Nova, Cape Breton, Canso and Sydney, Victoria. Can the Minister of Emergency Preparedness update this House on what is being done with the Government of Canada in partnership with municipal and provincial authorities to help residents in need? Question. 
The Minister for Emergency Preparedness. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for this very important question. I also want to thank um, all the members of Parliament from Nova Scotia who kept me informed so we can make the appropriate and timely decision to get the support uh, to the people uh, in need. And what I can say, Mr. Speaker, that Parks Canada leveraged the crucial snow removing equipment, and we did that within hours. And I also want to say thank you to our partners like the uh, Canadian Coast Guard, Team Rubicon, who rapidly put people on the ground to help their neighbours get out of uh, uh, get out from under the snow. And now, Mr. Speaker, that's over 500 people made available to provide this support. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Cypress Hills, Grasslands. For hundreds of years, First Nations have suffered under a broken system that takes power away from their communities and gives it to Ottawa. The Indian Act hands over all reserve land and money to the federal government, meaning First Nations have to go to Ottawa to ask for their tax revenues collected from projects on their land. But after eight years, the Prime Minister has allowed this system to continue. Our Conservative leader just announced his, his support for the optional First Nations resource charge that enables First Nations to take back control of their resources and money. Will the Liberal government put First Nations in control and support the FNRC, or will they let the Ottawa Knows Best model continue? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'd like to thank the member uh, for his question, and I'd like to thank the Conservatives for actually asking a question on Indigenous issues, <laughs> considering the fact that we, we agree that the Indian Act needs to change, and that's exactly why this government introduced the legislation on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This is why we continue to support that as Liberal, and when Conservatives had a chance, they obstruct it and vote against it. The Honourable Member from Brantford, Brant. Mr. Speaker, last night in shameful display, the NDP Liberal Coalition tried to shut down the committee studying the Arrive Can scam. This $54 million egregious abuse of taxpayers must be fully studied. Canadians deserve no less. More and more details are being revealed, and the corruption within the CBSA and this government is astonishing. The walls are caving in, the rot is being exposed. What is the coalition so desperate to hide? Yeah. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as I've said in this House time and time again, that we are happy to see the work that the committee is doing, that when we issued a contract for the ArriveKin app, that when we do so, we expect all procurement policies to be followed. The president of the CBSA has confirmed that there are internal audits and investigations happening. The police have been called when necessary. And Mr. Speaker, we look forward to the results of that investigation because because any acts of wrongdoing will come with consequences. The Honourable Member from Brantford, Brant. That type of response proves that this Prime Minister and the NDP Liberal government are simply not worth the cost. Let me clarify the record, Mr. Speaker. 76% of ArriveCan contractors performed no work. $11 million went to a two-person basement company for no work. And now top bureaucrats at the CBSA face accusations of lying to committee and even destruction of evidence. After everything else that has been exposed in this $54 million boondoggle, what else is the coalition agreement trying to hide? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, we have faith in the CBSA President who has already acknowledged that they've launched an internal audit on the concurrent procurement process. We look forward to the OEG report on Arrive Ken next week. Mr. Speaker, I have said time and time again that we are working hard to ensure that uh, when contracts are issued, that all procurement policies are followed. We look forward to these audits and the, o the AG report because if we can make further procurement improvements, we will. We expect contracts to be done properly. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown. Mr. Speaker, we know that families are struggling with the cost of living. For parents of young children, the Canada-wide early learning and childcare system is helping them return to the workforce while accessing affordable quality childcare. In Prince Edward Island, $10 a day childcare has been available since the 1st of January, and we can already see its positive impacts. Can the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development update this House on the progress that has been made as this important national system continues to be built out? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Minister for Families, Children and Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Child care is good for our kids, it's good for families, and it's good for our economy. Islanders have already been benefiting.
benefiting and seeing the savings. And as of January 1st, they've reached $10 a day, along with six other provinces and territories across this country. At a time when families are feeling the pressure, $4,200 in savings a year is outstanding. Instead of preying on Canadians' fears, Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives need to start listening to families. The Honourable Member from Churchill, Kuratinukaski. Mr. Speaker, four First Nations with Sagamac, Red Sucker Lake, St. Teresa Point and Garden Hill have declared a state of emergency. They are unable to bring in fuel and other necessities because the ice roads they depend on have melted due to climate change. We are talking about thousands of people stranded. For years, the Liberals, like the Conservatives before them, have ignored the need for an all-weather road for these communities. What will it take for the Liberals to help build the all-weather road needed for the East Side First Nations who are already paying the price of climate change. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for that very important question. We know that northern communities are dealing with the impacts of climate change firsthand, and this is no uh, difference from that. Remote communities relying on winter roads are living with firsthand impacts. The pressures are real. A shorter season and a shorter window to work on infrastructure projects like schools and water plants. We will do what it takes to make sure essential resources are delivered and communities have what they need throughout the year. I understand that meetings are in place right now with our Minister of Transportation as well, with the community leads. We're going to get to the bottom of this and make sure they have access. Thank you. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, on October 23rd, I asked the Minister of the Environment a question about the unreasonable delays in reimbursement of the Canada Greener Homes Grant. I was told that the government was aware and that the situation would improve. Yet, in my writing, people received a letter in December confirming that the grant had been approved and that they would receive their check within 30 days. Finally, 30 days later, they received a letter stating that their grant had been denied in Quebec, reimbursement takes two months. At the federal level, in Canada, it takes more than 18 months. Is there anyone in the government who is accountable and who could make sure that this important program can work? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. It's wonderful to see that there were so many Canadians who used a grant for greener homes and for loans. We've worked with Canadians to make it work well, and we are continuing to do so. And we have another program that will be coming soon to help people be better able to make these changes for their homes. We are getting to the end of oral questions. The Honourable Member, Fort Regina Capel. And as it is Thursday, I'm very excited to ask the Thursday question. And I was wondering if the government House leader can update members as to the business of the House for the rest of this week and into the next week. And I will take this opportunity to ask about how the government plans on managing Bill C-62. C-62, as you know, of course, is the response to...